Hi, my name is Maylene Diaz Pais, and I am a nurse practitioner with the University of Miami Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, I work in the Division of Transplantation and Cellular Therapy. And today we're going to be discussing the oncological emergencies um, that we see in our, in our cancer patients. I have no disclosures and no conflict of interest. So we're gonna do a brief overview over sepsis, anaphylaxis, and tumor lysis syndrome due to time constraints. Obviously there's a lot more different um, oncological emergencies that we can discuss. Um, so first off, we're going to go over sepsis, and sepsis is the systematic inflammatory response to a wide range of clinical insults um, to the body, and it's manifested by two or more of these uh, criteria. One is the temperature greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, or can be hyperthermia, so less than 96.8 Fahrenheit. Patients will usually um, show tachycardia, so heart rate above 90 uh, beats per minute, tachypnea, which is a respiratory rate above 20 uh, respirations per minute. And on their CBC, we might see a white blood cell count less than 4,000 or leukocytosis um, with a white blood cell count of above 12,000. In the differential, you may also see some immature uh, white blood cells indicated by bands greater than 10%. Remember that sepsis is life-threatening and is an emergency. 25% uh, rate in cancer patients with a mortality rate of up to 28%. And typically we see it caused with either gram-positive or gram-negative bacteremia or fungemia. So what actually occurs with the sepsis pathway? One, uh, in the beginning, we get microbes that enter the body's circulatory system. The release of endotoxins from either gram-negative bacteria or exotoxins from gram-positive bacteria stimulate the release of inflammatory substances within the body. These include macrophages, monocytes, neutrophils, and plasma cells. Um, which then activate tumor necrosis factor and cytokines. And then we see tissue inflammation. We see an extensive widespread vasodilation. Um, we see a decrease in arterial and venous tone, and then an activation of clotting mechanisms. And this in turn leads to capillary leak, uh, leak syndrome uh, with the third spacing of fluids. So you'll see hyperperfusion and decreased in oxygenation of the tissue and organs. We then see ischemia, cell death, and then coagulopathies. So signs and symptoms, again, like we mentioned, um, patients um, may or may not show fever. Patients may complain of chills or have the rigors. Um, we're gonna see that heart rate go up and the blood pressure drop down. Um, one thing with the hypotension, I, it's, to consider the hypotension in that patient. Um, so for example, if you have somebody who tends to run a little bit on the higher side, um, for example, uh, for some sickler patients, if you work on a heme floor with some sickler patients, um, they tend to run a little bit higher on blood pressure, even though you want them a little bit lower because of the risk for stroke. But for example, I've had a patient who normally ran in the 140s, 150s, and uh, you know my red light went up when the patient's systolic blood pressure was close to 105, 110, and within 30 minutes, my patient went into septic shock. Um, so again, just look at that trend. If you're starting to see that blood pressure drop down, that's just you know something to keep um, an eye out for. Again, the respiratory rate will increase. Patients might uh, show altered mental status, especially in our older population. And again, keep in mind with patients who are neutropenic, they may not necessarily show the classic signs and symptoms of sepsis, um, except usually fever. Um, and that's due to you know, the immunosuppression um, from having no counts and the lack of normal um, phagocytic and inflammatory responses within their system.
So how can we prevent sepsis? Um, you'll see a lot of these patients who are on treatment, they'll be on antimicrobial prophylaxis, especially during their neutropenic phase or their nadir period. Um, you might see them on antiviral medications, acyclovir, uh, valacyclovir is typically what's ordered. You'll see them on antifungal medications. Um, so sometimes they'll be on fluconazole is typically the medication that's prescribed and uh, antibacterial. Um, when they're neutropenic, you might see them on Leviquin, uh, prophylaxis or PENDK is another one that's used um, uh, to prevent uh, uh, these inf opportunistic infections from occurring while their, while their counts are low. Um, we see the use of growth colony uh, stimulating factors, especially during the time after chemotherapy when their counts are low. Uh, to try to shorten that nadir period after they get their chemotherapy. So that's another way that we help prevent sepsis from occurring. Uh, it's very important to educate these patients on good hand washing and avoiding exposure to individuals with known infections um, or who are sick. Uh, especially now with COVID, you know, all of our patients should be wearing their masks um, and gloves when they're in the hospital setting, teach them not to touch their face. Um, we educate patients and the caregiver on signs and symptoms to report that are concerning for infection. And the biggest thing is patients who are neutropenic is to give them their ER precautions and fever precautions. In a neutropenic patient, anything 100.4, it's not a wait and watch your episode. It's not take some Tylenol and see how you do. No, you have 100.4 fever and you're neutropenic. You just got chemo two or three days ago. Your counts are low that's a straight trip to the emergency room um, for admission. Um, with regards to nursing standpoint, you know, for central line, port lines, trifusion catheters, whatever central line that they have, you wanna make sure that you're using a set te technique according to your institution's protocol, very, very important. And you wanna encourage your patient with good patient hygiene, skin and mouth. Um, Cause again, you know, any little cut that flora that's normally on the skin, can even cause an infection, a cellulitis that can end up in the bloodstream. Um, I've had one patient, you know, uh, she had a dog, the dog jumped on her, um, older woman, and uh, the dog had scratched her on the foot and actually the weight of the dog caused her, her toenail to kind of fall off. And, you know, she didn't mention it until the end of her, her visit when I saw her and her it looked horrible. I mean, it did not look pretty. She didn't have any fever, um, but we admitted her for um, IV antibiotics. And I thank God within like the hour, she went septic um, in the ICU on ventilation, on pressors. She didn't make it out of that. She did, um, you know, got better and was able to go home. But, you know, could you imagine if she hadn't said anything? So also a big thing is to make sure that you're doing a good assessment on your patients. Um, so diagnosis obviously is based on presenting symptoms. Um, diagnostic studies include blood cultures. Um, you typically wanna do your peripheral cultures times two on, on the arm. If you have a central line, you still wanna do one from periphery from the arm and from the central line. You're gonna look at your CBC. You're gonna look at your CAM panel. You're gonna look at coagulation studies. Um, you're going to look at check sex rays, EKGs, arterial blood gases, and things that you just want to keep an eye out for, you know, is this elevated or decreased white blood cell count. Again, there are the numbers for you greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000. Your differential, you're going to look at those blasts. Um, you know, if they're high, definitely there, you know, there's a concern. Um, anemia, it's another thing that you can look for, thrombocytopenia. Um, very important in combination with your prolonged PT and PTT coagulation studies because sepsis can lead into um, DIC or disseminated uh, coagulopathies. Um, hyperglycemia, initially you'll see that occur. Um, you can see acute kidney injury, so an elevated BUN and creatinine, and then you can also see respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis in these patients. So treatment and management of, sep of sepsis for these patients. Um, antimicrobial therapy with a broad spectrum activity at first. Um, 
you want this done immediately. You want to start these antibiotics within the 30 minutes um, as possible and consult infectious disease. Um, typically, when you start the antibiotics, our rule in our institution, uh, we always start gram negative coverage first. Um, typically, we start it with cefepime and then we follow with gram positive coverage with vancomycin right afterwards. So, the one thing I've always taught. Um, when I teach new nurses coming on board or new nurses coming into oncology, that when you have a patient with neutropenic fever, the first thing that you want to do is hang up that cefepime within 30 minutes of them spiking. Obviously, you need to hang up your antimicrobials after you do your blood culture. So most of the time when neutropenic fever um, or sepsis, you know, a patient starts and you got two or three nurses helping you at the bedside, one is drawing cultures, the other one is, you know, changing the tubing, getting the antibiotics and is ready to start it as soon as the cultures are done. Um, supportive management, you can escalate to ICU, obviously if the patient is septic. Um, so respiratory support with ventilation if needed, um, or you know sometimes it's just as simple as a simple face mask or a Venturi mask, through resuscitation to bring that uh, blood pressure up. Um, so typically we'll hang up some lactative ringers, inotropic or vasopressin agents, um, you know, if the blood pressure is not responding to fluids, DVT prophylaxis with caution, because obviously, you know, sepsis can lead to DIC. And if you put them on anticoagulation, you can make that process worse. Insulin, ther insulin therapy as indicated, nutritional support. Um, you're going to correct any electrolyte imbalances and transfuse as needed um, for any anemia or thrombocytopenia that might be present. So the next topic we're gonna to discuss is anaphylaxis. Um, and typically we see this uh, with some chemotherapeutic agents um, as well as um, antibiotics. Uh, so anaphylactic is a adverse immunologic response to an exposure to an offending agent that can result in a life-threatening reaction. And it's caused by an immediate hypersensitivity reaction um, that's mediated by immunoglobulin E. IgE. So the signs and symptoms are of anaphylaxis, urticaria. So your patients are going to break out uh, in hives or they'll have a rash or complain of itchiness. Um, angioedema. So you'll see the swelling or puffiness around the eyes, sometimes around the lips. Um, and this is definitely a big concern because this can lead to a compromised airway. Um, Lar laryngeal spasm, you can see bronchial spasm. So patients are gonna tell you that they feel tight or you can even hear wheezing upon auscultation. You can have flushing of the skin, especially in the face. And again, like I mentioned, puritis, which is itching. So risk factors for anaphylaxis. Um, so medications, your typical medications that will place patients uh, that are, keep an eye out for anaphylaxis, penicillin, cephalosporins, the sulfonamides, so your sulfa drugs. Manitol um, is one of them. Cytarabine with regards to your chemotherapeutic agent, cytarabine, atopicide, nuflon, rituximab, um, ATG. Typically ATG, you see it more, uh, use it more for like our, our uh, aplastic anemia patients um, who, who require ATG or are seen in our transplant patients. Um, blood products is another risk factor, um, including donor cells. Um, there's some preservatives uh, with regards to uh, transplant patients like EMSO and uh, contrast that's used in imaging. Um, so, you know, I have a patient with a CT scan who's going to get the, the contrast, the CT scan, the iodine, that can be another um, cause for anaphylaxis. So pathophysiology and anaphylaxis, um, so antigen-specific IgE, again, which is the offending agent, will bind and synth uh, synthesize the mast cell to the antigen, and this is where you get the release of histamine and other um, cytokines and inflammatory mediators, and then this is what caused the signs and symptoms that we discussed in the previous slide. So management, your prevention is key for anaphylaxis, right? You want to avoid that offending agent 
once it's identified um, for medications that tend to be at higher risk. Uh, so for example, uh, rituximab, right? Typically we treat um, with antipyretics or um, uh, Benadryl before. Same thing with like blood, we do the same thing. We usually treat with Tylenol or an antihistamine before. Um, in patients who have had a known reaction, but the benefit outweighs the risk, sometimes you'll see them get steroids before um, the treatment uh, with a certain medication. Um, if it does occur, initial treatment is um, geared to stabilizing the patient by maintaining their airway patent and maintaining the hemodynamic stability. So you wanna place this patient on oxygen. You wanna stop whatever it is that you're infusing um, from, the, from going into the patient's IV. Uh, so you're gonna stop the infusion of the offending agent. Clamp it. You're not gonna hang up a fluid after that and give more of that medication in the line. You're gonna start a different line and give fluids because um, typically these patients their blood pressure will drop. So you'll go ahead and start giving them the fluids, either normal saline or lactated ringers. And then you have pharmacological treatment depending on the severity. Um, so sometimes you might give a little extra tannol, um, acetaminophen, or you'll give them a little bit more of antihistamine with diphenhydramine, or you'll give them um, uh, methylprednisone or prednisone. Um, typically, it's methylprednisone through the IV, so you'll give them a little bit of steroids through the IV, depending on the severity. Bronchodilators, if needed, to open up those airways if they're feeling very short of breath or they're having we uh, wheezing or tightness. And then um, having epinephrine uh, nearby to give that to the patient if needed. And our last topic is going to be tumor lysis syndrome. And typically, we see this at time of diagnosis. So patients who are there for induction chemotherapy or your first cycle of chemotherapy uh, following their diagnosis, this is when they're at highest risk for TLS. Um, so TLS occurs when there's a rapid cell lysis resulting from treatment. And what happens is you, you give the chemotherapy to this patient this, these tumor cells start to die. And when they die, they just burst and they release everything that's inside, goes outside into the cell and into the body and causes this reaction. Um, so typically uh, the stuff that we see inside that comes out is your potassium, your phosphorus and your uric acid. So when your electrolytes, you're gonna see high uh, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia, and uh, hypocalcemia as a response. So your risk factors for tumor lysis syndrome um, it is a high tumor burden. So patients who have uh, either, you know, have a high uh, white blood cell count from leukemia or patients that have lymphoma and it's just all over the place. As you see, you know, here in this picture, you see this one patient in A, and then you see compared to this patient in B, obviously the patient in B has a higher tumor burden, that patient's gonna be at higher risk for tumor lysis syndrome. All right, so signs and symptoms, again, depend on the degree of the metabolic abnormalities. How bad is your electrolyte panel? Um, kind of going back to you know, what you learned in nursing school, hyperkalemia, you're gonna see the patients with nausea, vomiting, paresthesia, muscle weakness, they can, paralysis, sync, they can occur lethargy, muscle cramps, um, diarrhea. And again, it's just the degree of how off your potassium is, how high is this potassium level. Um, you can see some EKG changes. You can see the patient go into V-fib because of this. Um, hyperuricemia, patients will complain of malaise, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, anorexia, edema, flank pain, typically because of kidney, fatigue, weakness, and again, as I mentioned, because of the kidney, you can see oliguria or anuria, and patients can go into acute renal failure. Hyperphosphatemia, um, it's again related because of the compromised renal function that can't clear this out. So patients will have osteemia, oliguria, and urea. Again, they can go into acute renal failure, and this goes in hand in hand with the elevated potassium levels. Hypocalcemia, patients 
will show, will show diarrhea, muscle cramps, muscle spasm, tetany, a positive Chevec sign, positive Trousseau sign. The patients can go into seizures, have syncope, um, strider, and anorexia. You can also see hypotension. You can see some cardiac arrhythmias, heart block, and even cardiac arrest. And again, these signs and symptoms, along with all of them, is just to how, how severe the um, imbalances in the electrolytes. Um, you know, they can, they can go also with alter mental status with any of these changes, okay? So you're gonna see these patients, they're gonna have electrolytes monitored very frequently. How do we diagnose tumor license syndrome? Again, it's based on clinical symptoms and your laboratory findings. So prevention is key. Um, you're gonna see a lot of these patients started on allopurinol and they're gonna be getting a lot of hydration um, to maintain urine output greater than 150 to 200 mLs per hour. You want to address each laboratory abnormality. So some of these patients might be placed on phosphate binders. They're going to have electrolyte replacements. Give them sodium bicarb for hydration, um, sodium polysulfonate uh, to help with that potassium, insulin to help with the potassium, diuretics if they're not hypovolemic, and dextrose. Some of these patients will require ICU monitoring, especially if they have any cardiac complications. And like I mentioned, aggressive IV hydra hydration if their cardiac status permits. And then there is another medication, um, Rasbier case that has now been approved with TLS, um, but very, uh, with these patients, we cannot give them in uh, G6PD deficient patients. So make sure that you um, get that enzyme checked before you see an order um, for Rasbier case in these patients. So here are my references and my contact information on the bottom should you have any questions. Thank you for your time.